are just driving towards the very southern tip of Hawaii's big island, which not so long ago was an absolute paradise. But this one-time paradise has become a magnet for the ocean's plastic. All you can see as far as the horizon is the remains of human refuse. So this could be from Asia, it could be from the mainland, America, and a lot of this stuff comes from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The Garbage Patch, also known as the North Pacific Gyre, is where ocean currents converge to create a concentration of plastics. A lot of the plastic at Camilo Beach has been circulating in the ocean for so long, it's been broken down into tiny particles or microplastics, which are nearly impossible to clean up. How frequently do you do these beach cleanups? You know, we've done 32 so far this year. We're going to pick the stuff up and come back down here next week, and it could potentially be just as dirty, if not worse. This plastic doesn't just ruin a day at the beach. It's estimated that nearly 700 marine species have encountered man-made debris. At Hawaii's Oceanic Institute, Dr. David Hirenbach is studying how plastic is becoming a permanent part of our ecosystem. So this bird was incidentally Whoa, that killed. Is a beast. And then you see the hooks coming out of the uh, neck. What is this? Is the gizzard? Much so the heart's out of the way. Let me just. <gasps> I see some plastic. Oh. Whoa. Okay. Look at that. A 2015 study predicted that as many as 90% of all seabirds worldwide now consume plastic as part of their diet. How far do you think most of this plastic has traveled from? It could be coming from anywhere. I mean, we're finding plastic in Antarctic species, you know, places where people don't really go. So this is really a global issue. And it's not just birds eating this plastic. Oceanographer Dr. Anella Choi is studying the plastic's impact on the entire ocean food chain. This is a lancet fish, and what's great about these guys is they sample the environment for us. So we sample the stomachs from different locations in the ocean, mm -hmm. um, take a look at what, what they're feeding on. Well, Whoa. look what we have here. Wow. What the hell is that? That's a giant piece of plastic. Oh, my God. These pieces of plastic are made out of petroleum and other chemical contaminants. When pieces of plastic are in the water column, they sort of act as little sponges. They actually accumulate toxins and then they get ingested by animals. And so we're still learning about the chemistry of what happens when fish like that eats it. How out of hand is this situation getting? Animals at almost every single trophic level of the food web in the open ocean are ingesting plastics. Yeah, it's the biggest habitat on the planet. Mm -hmm. And if there's plastic throughout that habitat, it's going to have some really serious impacts. Mm -hmm. Many of the species humans eat prey on lancet fish, meaning plastic is likely finding its way up the food chain and into our dinners. Are you worried that any of that plastic might find its way into the fish? Of course it happens. You know what I mean? How are we going to stop it? I don't know. It's coming from all over the world. So what happens when you've got the fish on the boat? You find like a plastic bag or like bottle caps, things like that. Wow. You are what you eat, depending on what the fish ingests. So it's probably not the best for the fish and for you. Plastic in our world's oceans is reaching crisis levels. Since the Great Pacific Garbage Patch was discovered in 1997, four additional patches have been found across the globe accumulating more and more plastic. We spoke with Dominic Boire at the World Economic Forum, who is tracking the problem on a global scale. Plastic is one of the most pervasive uh, human-made materials that we have. We have the problem that we make a lot of plastic, we kind of use it once or at the most twice, and then we get rid of it. And ultimately, it can only go into three places. It can be burnt, it can be landfilled, or it can be dumped. And dumping often then means the sea. And don't forget, I mean, the mass urbanization that we're going through, a lot of this is in coastal areas. Most big cities are by the sea. Eight million tons of that plastic goes into the ocean every year. That's about the equivalent of one garbage truck every minute. That one garbage truck will become four garbage trucks by 2050 or so. If we carry on that rate, there would be more plastic by weight in the ocean than fish. So there's a human sort of conundrum. This surely can't be good. 
What is the wake-up call? With 165 million tons of plastic already in the ocean and more being dumped in every day, it's hard to imagine how we would even begin to clean this up. But there is someone who is attempting to do just that. When talking about environmental issues, I think a common response is, well, that's a long way off. That's for our children to worry about. So, hello. Here I am. Since Boyan was 16, he's been on an environmental mission. Now, six years later, he's crowdfunded millions of dollars to start his own company, The Ocean Cleanup. Along with a team of top engineers and scientists, their goal is simple, to rid the world's oceans of plastic. We caught up with Boyan at the Ocean Cleanup offices and a plastic laboratory. So this is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This is the concentration of plastic. These are all specs here. Right. So there are, there are five of them in the world. Mm -hmm. And because the North Pacific is most polluted, we'll start with that. We're trying all these different variables, like how large should it be, what angle should it be, to get to a system that collects most plastic for as little cost as possible. Boyan and his team spent years mapping the Great Pacific Garbage Patch to understand how to go about cleaning it up. So talk me through how the ocean cleanup works. Really, the problem is that although there is a lot of plastic, it's spread out over a very large area. So you first need to concentrate it before you get it out. So what we propose is to deploy sort of an artificial coastline where there is no coastline. So we have this very long array of floating barriers that is anchored to the seabed. The, the ocean current does the hard work for us, brings the plastic towards it and concentrates in the center. And once it's in the center, it's so dense you can hardly see the water. And that's the spot where we can then easily take it out and store it before shipping it to land for recycling. Over 95% of the mass is still in those big objects, which is so urgent to clean up, because all that big stuff will become microplastics over the next few decades, which is the problem. Why has no one else attempted to clean up on the scale that you're proposing? People assume that uh, a complex problem requires a, a complex solution, but I think the simpler a solution can be, the better. When I started this, I didn't know whether it would work, but I thought considering uh, the scale of the problem, that it was just important to at least try. After months spent perfecting the design, Boyan's invention is ready for the ultimate test, to find out whether it can survive in the ocean. Welcome to the Ocean Cleanup's prototype unveiling. are pretty severe. Now, with the first minus storm, we'll get forces higher than during a 100-year storm in the Pacific Ocean. It's pretty safe to say that if it survives here, it will survive anywhere. But to scale the array to be scooping up the Pacific garbage patch, Boyan has a way to go. What we're seeing here is just one segment, and eventually the thing will be about a 1,000 times larger than this. Wow. And then somewhere in the center of this giant V-shaped array, we would have this conveyor belt, some pumps to extract the plastic. I mean, 100 kilometers, it's very large for a man-made structure, but it's peanuts compared to the size of the Pacific Ocean. Assuming everything does go to plan, what's the next step? We should be ready to deploy the first full operational system uh, by late 2017. So that will be the first time we're actually removing plastic from the ocean at the large scale. And then if that goes well, we should be ready to start the largest cleanup in history by 2020. So this is just uh, the beginning, it's not the end. While Boyan works towards hitting the next milestone of his experiment, he's simultaneously planning what to do with the degraded plastic he's able to collect and how to make it valuable again. This is one of the companies we're working with to actually produce the recycling product, because mm -hmm. eventually this is sort of how we want to finance the, the whole ocean cleanup. This is a machine where we put in the flakes, mm -hmm. uh, so the ground up uh, ocean plastic objects, so to get the, the highest quality of, uh, of plastic, we really want to sort it first before recycling it. And then it should Ooh, it's gonna exit it's gonna here as... It's like a pasta machine. It is exactly as a pasta machine. The process involves chopping up the plastic into tiny beads, known as nurdles. 
These are then sold and melted down into the objects we use in everyday life. So they're just throwing it up and nuggets? Yeah, so this is sort of the whole currency of the plastic industry. So car companies buy these nurdles to make their products and furniture companies use them as well. So it's sort of uh, giving ocean plastic a second life. This is pretty cool to know that this plastic has been around for the last few decades and could have come from anywhere in the world. And oh, yeah. Like and this could have well been some of the first plastic that was ever produced at scale in the 50s or 60s. While Boyne is recycling ocean plastics into more permanent uses, the vast majority of the world's plastics are never recycled at all. In fact, even the most commonly used are only recycled 14% of the time. But at IBM, Dr. Jeanette Garcia is developing a process called chemical recycling that could change how we think about plastics altogether. How do you see plastic? Is it a big problem or is it a great invention? I think of plastic as being a great invention because it permeates our entire life. Plastic is ubiquitous in everything from shoes, pills, to healthcare, to disposable syringes. And so to try to do away with it completely is probably not a viable option. Tell us about chemical recycling and why you think that's the answer. The main difference is that in mechanical recycling, what you're doing is you're taking the material and you have to shred it down and then melt it down, remold it, and it can only happen a certain number of times before it loses the properties. Chemical recycling is different because what you actually do is you take the material and you chemically react it so it goes back down to its most fundamental unit. That fundamental unit can then be reacted again back into the same thing or into something different. And we can reach a 100% like full cycle process. If we can scale this process up, we could take the hundreds of millions of tons of discarded plastics, recycle them, and move towards a zero waste economy. People are gonna start realizing that we can save money and a lot of money by recycling materials and so that it makes sense from all standpoints. We have to start thinking of our landfills as gold mines. With the right approach and the will to make it happen, all this trash would become valuable again. And solving this mammoth environmental task could create an economic miracle. Economically, if we had to pay for all that plastic, which we could do something better with, between 80 and 120 billion dollars a year, the economic value of what we're throwing away, effectively dumping. But like anything in life, if there's a problem, then there's going to be an opportunity. We know through history in terms of disruptions in industries or new products that it's kind of innovators and disruptors who kind of take us to the next level. The fact that we now are creating a path in which there is a chance that we can have clean oceans again, that could potentially inspire a lot more people to get involved with this problem. Human history is a long list of things that couldn't be done and then were done. Really the challenge this century is to convert a lifestyle created in a previous century into one that will still be around in the next century.